Copenhagen Research Hotel and the Big Sick, and we develop stepwise each year, and we have new things for you. Um, we are this group, many of you here actually helping with the workshop. This, uh, this is highly interactive. Uh, Michael Fries Tvede is a co-arranger, uh, also uh, back home at the uh, airway course. We uh, developed all the ideas together and we got several for this time. And he's also head of the, um, of the HIMSS, uh, medical part of the HIMSS service in Shell. And uh, we have got uh, Søren Rudolph, the same, developed several of the techniques we can be published on, we can tell about today. And he's the trauma manager at the uh, Rich Hospital in Copenhagen. Uh, myself, Michael. Very early in my career, I decided one of the most ugly situations is actually to put a patient to sleep and not being able to oxygenate him so that he dies or gets brain damage. It's such an ugly situation. I have been in a situation where afterwards I should explain to, um, uh, to the only son that his mother, fairly young and a dancer, had got permanent brain damage due to Every mention that retrospectively could have been done better. And I don't want any of us to uh, experience that. Uh, and since we, we, we have been and we are constantly working on trying to improve this for ourselves and for us and for our customers, our patients. This is a uh, Rich Hotel Copenhagen. You can see you are welcome even at night. You just land there and we have uh, coffee on the machine and we have got all kind of exciting uh, things to offer. We have our this is one of our prizes, a yearly uh, course, Airway Management for Anesthesiology, and we got this uh, web page, airwaymanagement.dk, and um, uh, that's important because several of the references will be obtainable there, and the videos and uh, material that you can use freely for your own, own education and for your peers. Um, and we like international participants there. And actually what we, uh, what we do, uh, we take the highlights and bring them to Sermat, and then we get inspiration and make new highlights. So it's a, it's a, a constantly uh, developing uh, process. We also, as course material for our course, we wrote this book together with 62 experts from around the world in airway management. It covers 95% of what you want to know about airway management. And the last 4% you get tonight, if you want, and then there's one that we are still uh, working on, and there will be more to come, of course. I, I, I have to admit, Danes and ski, that's challenging because we have very, very flat country. And here we have the highest point in mainland Denmark is, is 180 meters. But look at this. This is in Copenhagen, Denmark. This is the world's most advanced uh, power plant where we burn the waste and we make a lot of waste in Copenhagen. We've turned it into green energy. And on top of it, uh, we installed a ski slope. This is a view from the top. It's wonderful. You can see you can get up there and um, one of the best thing is actually the after ski bar because you've got a nice view of Copenhagen up there. Uh, this is a setting sun and this is uh, my son and uh, me uh, trying to snowboard down there. But we have, a, we have a hidden gem as well, part of the Danish kingdom, Greenland. The, word, the northern hemisphere the largest glacier, it's 2000 kilometers long and we have a lot of ice there and that becomes more and more valuable these days as you know. And there, actually, we have other means of transportation. This is a uh, this is local hunter and myself, a, a dog sling to the northernmost uh, natural habitat uh, uh, village in the whole world, um, smoking a cigar. This is a uh, I'll I, I never forget this patient because um, he was uh, he was his name was Perry, so he was a, a grand 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 grandchild of Perry who actually discovered the North Pole. So they didn't only spread inspiration but also their genes up there. And uh, these are some of the local drivers. This is, this is a, a Danish mountain, it's an iceberg, it got stuck in the fjord. And I, I looked at it for three days and then I decided, is it possible to ski an iceberg? And I can tell you it is, but it's a surprise. It's like an ice cube. So it's not snow, it's hard ice underneath. So you have to have very sharp edges down there. Okay, so we, have, we are so lucky we have uh, several guests. We have uh, Chris Root. Um, from a uh, neighboring state to uh, Texas, where they uh, also have uh, mountains, and uh, we want to visit him there. And we have Rasmus Helsel from our own department, also involved in all the developments, and uh, he will also uh, be part of the lectures. We have John Daniels from Geneva, who's, uh, who will uh, show you very, very interesting new ventilatory um, 
Aspects uh, together with me. We got Tatana Dill from Switzerland showing also sound of the airway, and then we got uh, Pims um, uh, from the Netherlands, we've got Hilda, we've got Luca, we've got uh, Gagali also from Geneva, Dielse here from Switzerland, Tron from Norway, he's a very good skier. Oh, we don't like it, the Danes, but he is. And we got uh, Maria from Bulgaria, we've got Mike, and we've got um, uh, uh, Willem Jan and we've got Christian M. Got Nels Petter. And you're going to meet all these uh, nice people uh, later at the workshop. And we'll take the discussion after the whole session because maybe some of the questions will be answered or be even more complicated. So we'll take them afterwards. And then the leftover questions during the hands on workshop where we'll be available for three hours and you can just um, enjoy what you want. Um, so we want to be able to manage, for instance, a place like this. He's a difficult airway. He, he, had, he had surgery some hours ago, and there he was difficult. He needed an awake intubation. And now he's in the post and sees a recovery. He's bleeding like this, and um, mm, he needs redo surgery. So before you leave, you'll be able to manage this guy and many, many uh, others, uh, guys like him. So we'll talk about air management. What is it? Why should that be important? Uh, about plan prediction combination and special circumstances. What is it? It's, <laughs> it uh, keeps being fascinating. This tiny piece of anatomy from the tip of the mouth until distal trachea uh, has to stay open all life. Uh, if it's closed more than a few minutes, you know, brain dead is two more minutes, death. Um, and uh, this, is, um, this is my son. The moment you cut the nature's uh, ventilator, the umbilical cord, from there on, you, it has to stay open, and part of it is our responsibility. There's except, there are exceptions, of course. If, you have, uh, if you're on an ECMO machine, or you have your head in ice water, then you can do a few more minutes. Uh, and the very interesting, it's our responsibility. You in here, two-thirds of you are in specialties, or maybe even 80%. I've read all, we read the list of participants, where this is our responsibility. We cannot call on a surgeon or, or something else. We need to be able to fix the situation. This is the best study ever on um, on uh, airway management on complications. It's old. It's already 12 years old. I'll just cite a very few things because 80% of it is still true. Um, they had a one-year data collection in the United Kingdom. They had uh, this number of cases related to general anesthesia and 19 deaths, brain damages, and um, in the ICU fewer cases, but a higher fraction of deaths and brain damage. And when these cases were analyzed in detail, and in three quarter of the cases, there was actually poor management. And uh, ICU and emergency is highly overrepresented here. And this is only the tip of the iceberg. This is absolute minimum numbers. The reality is, is more grave. And this is why it's worth being here. It's preventable in the majority of cases. We can prevent that to happen. Um, what happened there, a failure to plan, and if they had made a plan, failure to follow the plan, and we can, it's natural, we can all end up in that situation, but if we can try to avoid it. This is a much newer study, 2021, in tube study, uh, 3,000 ITU patients intubated, and uh, events occurring within the first half hour of, um, of the intubation procedure, you see, uh, one on 20 is a ideal intubation, difficult intubation, aspiration, pneumothorax, uh, pneumomesiastinum and frontal neck uh, airway management. So it still happens, and this is also the tip of the iceberg. No doubt this is underrepresented uh, here. We, um, we have a lot of choices on for M medicine new airway. We can either do nothing that the patient breathes, give a bit of local anesthesia, we can supplement with, with a gas mixture with a lot of oxygen in it, we can put on a face mask, we can put the face mask down in the throat, then it's called a laryngeal mask airway. We can put it all down in the trachea, then it's called an endotracheal tube, or we can put it via the front of the neck, then it's called a, a, a tracheostomy, a front of the neck airway, and we can cannulate the large vessels, then it's called ECMO. So, and this can combine, we can do this awake, anesthetized but still breathing, or anesthetized and apneic, and we can decide where we want to place our patient, what's best. Um, we need to have a plan. I'll very brief walk you through uh, algorithm that may sound very boring, but that's a framework for the, for the new development. So we must have a plan, otherwise we go into the gray. This is the peak-to-peak -peak gondola uh, in um, Whisper. No, um, in, um, what was it? It's in, uh, in uh, Canada. So we need some plan prediction. 
And these are the new American guidelines, these are the Canadian guidelines, and we'll walk you through the Canadian guidelines because they are the best, the most well thought of. And again, if you download this as a PDF, you will have a very good textbook actually on error management. F uh, most important statement, uh, prior to error management, a document strategy should be formulated for every patient based on every evaluation. Every evaluation that can uh, be done like uh, this, please. Uh, please open your mouth. Yes. Could I ask you kindly to stick up your tongue? Yes, please. And uh, would you mind to show me your <laughs> lower teeth? And would you mind bend your head uh, backwards? And then I can measure the environmental distance. And that took 15 seconds. No excuse. Even in the semi emergent situation, we can get some uh, impression of what will be difficult here. And it has been it has been disputed is it worth trying to predict and it is worth trying to predict uh, at least half of difficult intubation can be predicted and that is likely to be the obvious and most difficult patients that we can predict so it's worth spending this 15 seconds or at least have a look and it also works for predicting when do we need a wake intubation when do we need to use a flexible scope for instance so it is worth these are the canadian guidelines they start by the by the question: Is tracheal uh, intubation predicted to be difficult? And then there is a row of questions down, uh, downwards. And if we answer no to all of these uh, questions, then it's okay to give general anesthesia and give airments after the general anesthesia. So, first question: um, Is um, awake tracheal intubation absolutely uh, necessary? And sometimes it is because there may be no mouth opening at all or other circumstances, then of course we can answer yes and go to the right. And then the next question, will it, is it, will it be possible or difficult rather to do face mask or superglottic airway ventilation? And if you say no to that, that will not be difficult, then uh, we go on, this is about the prediction. And then we should uh, look for adverse um, uh, physiological uh, questions. And that could be, for instance, uh, especially uh, decreased apnea tolerance, meaning that you don't have enough oxygen for, for um, a longer time. That could be a decreased uh, functional residual capacity, or uh, even you start out being hypoxic, which is often the case with our patients. Or it could be a full stomach, or it could be uh, a patient that is likely to hemodynamically crash if we give anesthesia. Next question, are there uh, complicating contextual issues, and you'll get more to hear. Uh, get to hear more about that. It could be an adverse location, and it could be that we don't have help, and we are inexperienced. We lack equipment, and we don't know our team. For instance, some uh, sometimes we end up working in a hospital where they don't even speak our languages, uh, and it could be poor communication. And then there is one important consideration that's actually missing. Even though it's the best airway guide, one is missing. And there's one point where the Americans are smarter than the Canadians. That is the question, will a front and neck airway access be difficult? Because that has to come in here and you see actually ASA, the Americans, in this particular, they, they remember to include this. But if you combine them, we get the best guidance. And predictions of difficult front and neck airway access, you see I put it in parentheses because after today, It'll, it'll be easy for you to predict because you'll learn how to use ultrasound to see where is the cricocyte memory or where is the trachea. Okay, and we if you answer no to that, then we can put the patient to sleep and intubate or mask ventilate or whatever we want. If we can answer yes to some of these questions, then we should uh, think about could the patient cooperate to awake intubation and is there time for awake intubation? Why on earth is that interesting? We'll come back to that. And uh, that could be either awake tracheal intubation or it could be awake tracheostomy and awake front and neck airway access. Awake, why is this a good idea? Because the airway is uh, preserved, the patient airway is preserved, we don't have to make it. Um, spontaneous breathing is preserved, we don't have to force uh, oxygen in there. It's easier to look, uh, identify the glottic opening if actually uh, bubbles are coming up from the trachea. And then the patient can help her. For instance, if you say, would you kindly uh, protrude your tongue? He can do so. Or would you kindly protrude your lower jaw? He can do so as well. And that gives us more space. Uh, he can be sitting up. And there are several other advantages. But he, he can, we can observe his neurological status, for instance, if he has a cervical fracture. So there are many advantages linked with awake intubation. If we 
uh, keep the patient breathing, but he's unconscious, then we can only say yes to the first three questions. He cannot cooperate, and the rest will be a no. And if we give the uh, patient full anesthesia and or new muscular blockade, then we can say no to all of the questions. So that's why awake is such a good idea. So we go on with this flow chart. If we can say no to this, there's not the patient cannot co uh, collaborate or there's no time for it, then we, we can do this, uh, have an airway double setup, which is highly relevant also uh, in, in uh, some traumatic patients, for instance. That consists of, we identify the uh, marking of the cricocyte membrane before we give anesthesia. And if you can't palpate it, we use ultrasound. We decide who should do the uh, actual access of the, um, of the airway. We ensure we have equipment there, and we decide beforehand what will be the trigger, which which uh, uh, physiological parameter to reach when we do this. And then we can um, do the double airway, double setup, and then we can give anesthesia. We get a lot of oxygen, first of all, and then we can give anesthesia, and often it will work. If it doesn't, we are totally ready for the emergency uh, front and neck airway. This is when we when we can predict difficulty. What I show you is about when we have some prediction. Then. In the other setting, we already have an unconscious patient. Either he was brought to us by Air Samat, or we find him on the street, or somebody puts him to sleep, but now the patient is already conscious, so it's another situation. Then, um, and we can't readily intubate, so then the question is, can we ventilate, of course, with a mask or a superclotic airway? And if we say yes, we have, we have time, we can do additional attempts, and um, then, uh, uh, if we still have a ventilation uh, uh, unproblematic, then we can uh, um, consider an exit strategy that could be awaken the patient or put a superglottic airway and continue with the procedure. If we say no to these questions, we cannot ventilate. Then we over here in the uh, cannot ventilate, they call it cannot ventilate, cannot oxygenate situation. And then um, if the patient is, um, is uh, currently or in, in imminently hypoxic, then uh, we, while we prepare for the front neck airway access, we can do one more attempt at, at securing the airway with laryngoscopy or superglottic airway or what we want. And if that's successful, we have w once on time. If it's unsuccessful, then it's about the front of neck airway access. And all of you who want it will have the opportunity to try on a nice mannequin to do front of neck airway access after you have learned to find the Cricocyte membrane with ultrasonography later tonight, and you can even drink beer together with it. Okay, so that's a framework that we work within. Now we'll have a look at some special techniques. Um, we have so many choices, it uh, keeps coming new choices, and it seems that every, every Chinese who has a factory that can make something of our plastic makes a new laryngoscope, for instance. Uh, so we have flooded with it. But we'll show you that even if you have to live without the advanced equipment, out without these nice things, then you can still, even this little, you can still do advanced airway management. And we'll show you two techniques that you'll also be able to practice uh, during the workshop, because this may come in handy if, if you work in a remote place, if you go to Greenland without bringing equipment, if we end up in a, in a um, uh, yeah, I'll tell you later, an African hospital. So we would like a method that is uh, a symbol that is uh, only demands cheap single-use equipment that can be applied in awake or anesthetized patients that uh, can be applied even in bloody airways and that works for all or nasal intubation and that allows easy reintubation if necessary. We would like that, we've got it, and before the, the evening has turned into night, you will all be able to do it. We need this equipment, we need uh, a, an epidural castle, we need an IV cannula, and we need a tube, and this is a luxury version. If you also have a, a forceps or some lubrication, or some local anesthesia, it's really a luxury, but it's not strictly necessary. This is rate to grade intubation, and there are several techniques published for this. The, the smartest and the cheapest is this one called pulling instead of guiding, meaning that, um, and I have several videos of this, but, but I'll, sh uh, I'll show that uh, later on in the presentation. So. Um, what we do is that um, we uh, penetrate the anterior neck, uh, we um, put in an epidural catheter through the anterior neck, let it come out the mouth, 
and then when it when the F dual test is, uh, uh, came out, the mouse will will make half a knot in the tube like this, and then we can pull the tube down past the tongue, past the pharynx into the trachea. And once we pulled it until the um, uh, tracheal wall, we stop pulling and we push, and then the tube goes into the trachea in the majority of cases. I'll show you later in a real case. Okay, another cheap and useful technique is called the tube tip in pharynx. And I like very much this introduction. This is Fort Hakur up in the uh, uh, Guinea Bay in uh, Africa. One of our nurse anesthetists on a Sunday morning, it's, it's, she was in this hospital uh, with a médecin sans frontières, and she sent me this email uh, uh, many years ago and says uh, something like this. Uh, Dear Michael, you have indirectly contributed to saving the life of one of my patients tonight here in Africa because you taught me the G-tip technique. So we will share it with you as well because this is, um, this is smart. Um, and it's a, a simple single-handed and it requires, requires definitely minimal equipment. So what we do is that you pull the jaw forward and then we introduce uh, the tube about 10 to 12 centimeters. We inflate the cuff and then we close uh, the nose and mouth and uh, pull the jaw forward and then uh, we ventilate. This is a classic technique. The even simpler technique is when you just take the, the hand from, from the caudal end and close the mouth and, now, mouth and nose like that. This is a very tiny nurse anesthetist and a very big patient and uh, actually with uh, failed ventilation and it was saved there. Um, it looks like this. The nurse just had it demonstrated. The patient, this patient is asleep, um, pull the jaw forward, introduce the tube, and um, fill the cuff with uh, about 20 milliliters of air, and then attach either your self-inflating bag or the anesthesia system, and close the mouth and nose, and pull the jaw forward, and ventilate. It looks like this, and... Uh, huh. That could be in the stomach, but this is a luxury situation. We have the, the waveform technography as well. And um, we have uh, several publications now on this, and <laughs> it keeps amazing, at least me. Then we can combine techniques. And Rasmus, please tell us some obvious combinations. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, it is indeed a uh, great honor to be here in uh, Samad uh, together with you guys and the TBS uh, team. Um, I've been looking forward to this. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, a bit about the combined uh, techniques. Um, and to set this uh, scene or the frame for this, allow me just to, to have you, all of you, close your eyes for a minute. Just close your eyes. Inhale. And now you're all anesthetists. It's your dream come true. Uh, you're all anesthetists, okay? For the next couple of minutes, you're all, okay? But the thing is, it's 2.30 um, in the morning, and you're called to the OR, so maybe not a dream come true anyway. So you're there, um, you rush to the OR, and you walk in, and what you see, they're doing a grade one and a half cesarean section. Um, there's a registrar or colleague there, um, sets not very good, the, the BMI 43, um, they tried uh, DL, they tried VL a couple of times, they changed to a hyperangulated blade. The patient is quite good rammed, muscle relaxation is in, um, everything is good. DSATs still, and they placed an IGL. And, and they're quite happy with it, uh, and they called uh, you to, to the situation. And the obstetrician is like, Guys, uh, we need to move forward, but you have this. Uh, the capnography is, is okay, but it's not perfect. Sets are 86. Uh, it's not good. And is this, what is this? Is this aspiration? Is a little bit of vomit uh, coming out from the uh, attempt of bark mask ventilation attempts? So that could be a situation. I don't know what you would have done, but now we're going to talk about intubation to superglottic airway device. So this is what you're going to do, okay? Um, so combined techniques, um, so I'm going to show you a video in a minute, and I know that you got various equipment, 
uh, for this uh, intubation through a supraglottic airway device where you come from. Um, the smart thing about this technique is that you can ventilate uh, throughout uh, all, most all the procedure. So I know there's an entry catheter, uh, which uh, many of you got for this uh, same procedure. But um, yeah, just let me show you this video of, of how you can do it with uh, ventilation going on at the same time. Hopefully this will work. So this could be an IGL as well, anything, pretty standard thing, confirm, yeah, waveform, capnography, coming there, happy, so they disconnected, they insert the tube, Half a distance, approximately. And you need to lubricate, obviously. Yeah. Always lubrication. Always lubrication. And inflate the cuff. We put on the uh, adapter with the uh, bronchoscopy connection. And you start the ventilator. Okay? Pretty simple. But the difference is that you're ventilating the patient now. Okay, you didn't disconnect it and start putting in your flexible scope. You're ventilating the patient now on the ventilator. And you can you can cut a hole in the membrane, that's fine. Uh, if you've got a slim scope, you might not need it. If it's very well lubricated, you might not need it. But she's doing it. And you'll need an assistant to hold that tube still uh, and maybe straighten it out a bit, even more than this. Hopefully you'll be in the right spot. I've seen the video before. Yeah. Okay, in goes the scope. You see the carina. Everyone's happy. You're breathing normally again. Yeah, you deflate the cough. It's important. Yeah. Actually, you can see, of course, the waveform is not as perfect as it was before, but the patient is still getting air. Okay? Take it out, put it on. And confirm. Okay. Oh, good. So the might you might see a difference between this situation and the situation I was trying to paint in your inner um, picture before. So this is quite a few steps. So it it will need training. How many of you have trained this in elective cases? Hands up. Yeah. And the thing is. You might be training it, but your assistant needs training as well. So you all remember the intubation, the ILMA, the intubation laryngeal mask. That needed some adaption, some muscle memory as well. Um, and this will do as well. It's quite simple and it's doable. It is effective, but it's rare and it needs training. Okay. You're still an anesthetist. So you go back um, to your room. You go to sleep, but it's 4.30 in the morning and you're called to the ED. Ah, oh, the ED. So the emergency physician says, oh, you might come down here. Um, and he says, oh, is there a, a, an airway you can't handle? I said, no, oh really? But you might wanna see this before you take this patient to OR in a minute. Okay. So we go down there and we see this patient. Um, I said, yeah, looks pretty. Pretty awful. The patient needs uh, needs OR surgery for severe bowel obstruction. Okay, so needs to go to OR. Surgeon says, "Yeah, no doubt." And you want to do this awake. Okay, anyone who's just want to put this patient to sleep? No, no one. No one. That's saying yes. Okay, 
Maybe there's a little bit of um, local anesthesia on the front of the neck here. I can see that already. But anyway, so I say, yeah, um, no worries. I'll just go through the nose. And the surgeon says, no, there's severe pathology up there. And um, so we got, we got some trouble with our normal awake, uh, flexible intubation procedure. Um, and I'm going to show you a simple technique, which is quite correlated to what Michael just uh, explained to you before. So we will see a video of the combined uh, tube tip in pharynx with the flexible scope uh, intubation. Uh, here we go. Combined techniques. Pictures of that before. Should be here, yeah. It might feel strange, yeah. Lubrication. And as with the superglottic, it might not be perfect positioned at the first attempt. So you might need to reposition. Um, and I've, we've just published uh, a paper on the superglottic intubation thing, and I've watched 100 intubation through that, and it's not as easy as it looked before. But here we go. This is quite easy. Yeah. And this is a patient with um, normal anatomy in the hypopharynx. And if you haven't seen this before, see how close the um, fibrocryogen uh, membrane is uh, with the cannula is to the vocal cords. Do you see that? Okay. Deflation, important again. Insert the tube. Yeah. All right. So, um, tube goes in. But the thing is here, this is very simple topicalization as however you do it in your normal standard procedure for, for your patients to be tolerated, intubated, awake, um, can be effective. Um, and this, is, this might be rare, but I mean, there's a lot of people with um, radiation therapy to their jaw or mouth uh, going through other kinds of uh, procedures where you might need this uh, technique, okay? Um, so wherever you are practicing. All right. Cool. I'll hand this uh, back to Michael now, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Rasmus. And the good thing, you will all be um, able to try this uh, guided by uh, Rasmus and uh, some of the other instructors in a few hours, in, um, in one and a half hour up there. So we'll keep combining and we'll keep uh, using techniques in combination. What if the case is that we, we look into the mouth, for instance, with a flexible scope, and we can't find the little hole in the big hole, the big hole being the mouth and the pharynx, the little hole be, being the entrance to the airway. And oh, now that it could be here, it could be here, or it could be here, we don't know it. And it could also be covered with, uh, by blood. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if it was uh, flashing towards us like this? Who would like that? 
Uh, or, or who wouldn't? Yes, we would like that. Good thing is that it's now possible. And you will all try this at the workshop as well. Because we use this technique. Um, this is a, a lady for awake intubation. She's got nasal oxygen. We identify a cricothyroid membrane. We place a small emitter of infrared light between 700 and 1000 nanometers. And that will uh, put this invisible light to the cricothyroid membrane. We give local anesthesia as usual for awake intubation. We prepare some more local anesthesia with a flexible scope. And um, then we start this one and we introduce um, uh, the flexible scope via the mouse. And where we normally look for something black, meaning uh, the trachea, we now look for some flashing light if it works. So we've got a lot of sputum here, but we haven't given, we have given glycoparallel. And then we, we would like to see some flashing light that will show us where to go. This is a uvula, that's not what we want. This is a blood end. There we got it. So you see it from below the vocal cords. You go towards it and you go, yeah, you advance the scope until you are in, um, of course, until you're in the mid or lower part of the, the trachea. You see it coming in through the cricothyroid membrane like this. And uh, you go down till you see the carina, and the rest is, of course, business as usual. So she didn't have really severe pathology, she just had narrow space. What about real uh, severe pathology with uh, tumors in there? That's where we really need it. And we go uh, uh, via the mouse, the pharynx, and we look at this mess. Look here. Hmm. The patient is awake, of course. We got some local anesthesia, but it's a bit difficult to see where to go. We would like some, oh, did you see it? We would like a hint of flashing. Is it over there? No, it's not flashing. It's light, but not flashing. Ah, there we got it. Let's move around the corner. Let's go beyond the false cords and beyond the true cords. We see the cricothyroid membrane from the inside and the rest is procedure as usual. So we, I like this case. It was a case where the surgeon presented the, the, the patient was and uh, they do a, a pre-anesthetic nasendoscopy and it, they wrote inability to visualize the vocal cords due to a pronounced swelling. They tried, they couldn't see anything on the other side. Ah, we'll use the infrared light. So we did. Okay. But does this work in clinical daily practice or is it only exotic? So we actually just uh, uh, 23 published a randomized uh, uh, comparative study where we took patients for all awake intubation with a flexible scope and we um, uh, mimic it, uh, it as much to the daily uh, clinical situation. So it was even trainees who were appointed to that room that did the intubation because they want to see if it works in daily practice. What we did is that we did two insertions in each patient. One, we had a randomized uh, crossover design. One was with the infrared first and then no infrared. The other was with no infrared and then infrared. And the primary endpoint was at which point in the airway could you see a, a, a sure guidance of where to go, either the vocal cords or the flashing lights. And we had 44 insertions in 22 patients. And the red one is with the infrared flashing lights. In some cases, you're already up in the mouth or in the majority case, in the oral pharynx, you could actually see the flashing light and start going for it. Whereas uh, uh, without, you had to go to, to the tip of the aeroglottis or to the original at the level to see it. And um, it was also faster. And um, yeah, this is the ease, uh, subjective reported ease by the anesthesiologist. So we conclude that it is easier to identify the airway and we can do it uh, uh, higher up in the airway with a higher success rate there. Okay, further combinations and special circumstances. Michael Fries Trede and Søren Rudolf, please. Thank you, Michael. Um, um, as Michael told you, um, we looked at all the participants here, and my God, it is a really daunting task to give a talk on pre-hospital airway management to this crowd. There's so much experience in here. Um, we stood here last year and um, talked about 
pre-hospital airway management. And um, we stumble upon, upon a bit of controversy because we spoke about in-cabin intubation. We thought that it was, well, this is something new, this is something that we need to try. Um, and our message was more or less that you need to think about your practice. And it sparkled so much discussion afterwards. So we really came back to the, to the point that we need to look at this further. So this is what we're going to do. So we took a look at the literature and we learned a bit. We didn't learn everything, but we learned a lot. So what we want to do today with this short lecture and especially afterwards, we want to share some of the thoughts we have on doing confined airway space management. And we really want to learn from you guys. You have so much experience. Um, so going back to the Canadian guidelines, as Michael said, these are, in my perspective, the best guidelines. Um, and if you think about pre-hospital airway management, there's one sentence in here that actually encapsulates what is the essence of pre-hospital airway management. And the question is, are there any complicating contextual issues that might impact the decision? But it's not really a question, it's more like a statement. There are complicating contextual issues that will impact the decisions on airway management. This is the essence of pre-hospital airway management. And confined spaces is a really, really major contextual issue. So if you look at the literature, there is not a lot, and most of the literatures are done in mannequins. Um, and we've, we won't put any references up, but we've combined, we, we, uh, this is, uh, you can all take this IR code, and then you can find the lists of, uh, of publications that we've found. So please do that, and you, some of you might find some of your own publications in here, and thank you so much for for letting us use those publications. All right, so first of all, what is a confined space? You all know this reference which says something about your age. Um, obviously, when you don't have enough space, that's a giveaway, dead giveaway. But also, if you have too much of something else, and what would that something else be? We'll, we'll take a look at that. So your traditional thought about a confined space, this is a confined space. This is a confined space. This is a confined space, and you actually also have problems getting in and getting out here. The slight temperature, some of you work in conditions like this. And you have difficulties with both access, extrication, and a chaotic uh, scene. A lot of noise, a lot of stimuli where you need to take your decisions. And if we don't have a patient in a confined space, we will certainly bring a confined space to the patient. This is our helicopter, the EC-135. You see here, nice patient, not a lot of room if you want to do airway management inside this cabin. This is another one, this is not our helicopter, this is uh, the helicopter some uh, Yeltsin works in. This is the standard confined airway uh, a confined space on wheels, a standard Danish ambulance. And you can have pretty good room. This is the 138, uh, the uh, Airbus uh, uh, or AW138. Um, you have pretty good room here, but then you, you, you place the stretcher in a pretty awkward situation and you close the doors. Then you have really, really bad airway access here. The modern ICU. Great for patient care, bad for airway management. You need to do some manipulation of your environment here. And we have larger and larger ORs, but we tend to fill them with robots, equipment, surgeons, a lot of surgeons, and we tend to create our own confined, airways, uh, or confined spaces within those ORs, even though they are very big. And obviously, sometimes we encounter patients that will maybe make that space confined even 
if it wasn't confined to start with. So, um, what should we do? Sadly, there is no single technique that can be used in any setting. But depending on situations, there will be specific devices that may be of advantages. Well-known devices or techniques that you already know uh, may be used in alternative ways, or you may adopt another way of uh, accessing the airway. Um, and when we look at this, we certainly we think you should actually think about this in a way that is it a controlled or an uncontrolled environment? And Michael, you will uh, talk about the controlled environment to start with. Thank you, Sean. This is uh, me in a helicopter, our helicopter EC-135, as uh, Søren said. Uh, this was actually my first uh, attempt uh, of uh, in-cabin, in-flight uh, intubation, which uh, would kind of uh, set this uh, discussion, um, uh, began uh, or initiated, initiated, initiated our discussion about uh, in-cabin, um, uh, in-flight, intubation and now uh, confined space uh, intubation. It's a CPR, uh, cardiac arrest scenario. Patient is um, uh, resuscitated uh, with a laryngeal mask. It worked um, quite well uh, for some time, but uh, he began to be uh, on uh, cooperating and uh, I decided to, um, to uh, take out the uh, laryngeal mask and uh, intubate with a uh, video laryngoscope. It was uh, absolutely uneventful. It uh, went uh, very well, um, and, uh, but it's not something we do uh, every day, which uh, the look of the paramedic kind of uh, shows here. Um, I'm happy. The patient is uh, satisfied, giving me a thumbs up. And we uh, fly on. Um, this was, uh, as I said, the uh, beginning of uh, our discussion about uh, in-flight uh, intubation. Uh, I'm not very sure that uh, it's something that we should uh, recommend because uh, there is, uh, it, it, it may uh, cause trouble for ourselves, but at least uh, in-cabin uh, intubation uh, is something worth, worth uh, uh, considering because, um, for instance, this, uh, this uh, study uh, that we conducted, sorry, uh, the, f uh, the first uh, article from the FASTA group showed uh, in uh, 422, um, drug-assisted uh, pre-hospital intubation showed that um, uh, the fa first pass success was uh, rather high and that uh, the uh, situations where in-cabin intubation was uh, done uh, caused a uh, uh, shorter on-scene uh, on time, which we uh, believe is uh, important for a patient uh, outcome. doesn't show that uh, in-cabin is uh, superior, but uh, neither uh, inferior. You should know your environment. Uh, you should uh, train in your environment. Uh, you should know your equipment, and you should have everything readily available when you uh, try to uh, do in-cabin uh, in, in, in intubation. This is our kit dump from the helicopter. Um, it's checked every uh, morning and it uh, gives us uh, everything uh, needed besides uh, drugs. Um, and um, I believe that it's uh, one of the key uh, issues for doing uh, successful in-cabin uh, 
and especially in flight intubation, that everything is where you expect it to be. Changing helicopter, changing environment, makes it more uh, complicated. And uh, uh, there is examples that uh, when a service uh, gets a new helicopter, suddenly their um, uh, time uh, consumption is much higher because um, uh, things, everything is uh, different. And talking about uh, everything being different, these are two of my uh, colleagues. Thomas and uh, Stine, they are both uh, uh, consultants. Uh, and obviously, it's uh, another situation for Stine in a helicopter and from uh, Thomas in a helicopter. And actually, Søren and I uh, discussed that uh, some things may be easier for me, being not that tall, uh, easier for me than it is for, for Søren. I don't know if that should alter our decisions, but at least it should um, make us, uh, um, we should be aware of the differences and it may uh, influence our decision. And now for the uncontrolled environment. Thank you. Okay. So everything that you do in the controlled environment, everything you do as a part of your standard practice is now you need to manipulate this when you encounter the uncontrolled environment. So um, the first thing that you do is when you encounter something, you need uh, to size up the scene, size up the OR, size up the ER, size up the room you enter. What are the considerations you need to focus on? Well, first of all, your own safety. And it's especially in pre-hospital care, but what is your own safety? What is the patient's safety? And what are the immediate patient needs? And how do I get in and how do I get out? And how can I manipulate that environment to do as safe airway management as possible? And really, if we should recommend anything, we recommend don't intubate in a confined space. But if you do have to do it, these are some of the things you can manipulate, some of the things you have to consider. There are special devices, there are special techniques, there are the position of the rescuer and the position of the patient. But you need to consider these things and train them in advance. All right, so what should, what, what can we recommend? Well, we can recommend using a supergodic device. In every study, mannequin studies and also clinical studies, if you compare time to effective ventilation, superglottics will win every single time. So sticking in a superglottic, extricate the patient, that would be my first recommendation uh, for pre-hospital airway management in confined spaces. And you can see, yes, in this instance, uh, I think it's a it's a British picture and it's um it's an older picture sticking in the intubating LMA. I don't know, uh, are any of you still using intubation LMAs pre hospitally? Yes, she is. Uh, but it's more or less just disappeared um, uh, for for some years. If you do want to intubate, expect a higher failure rate. Expect longer times and it really doesn't depend whether you use VL or VL and all different types of VL that you can get it will take you longer time it will fail more often um, and you do have to train this familiarity with your kit dump as Michael said familiarity with the environment you work in is a plus you need to train um, Having really good stand operation procedures uh, will make it easier to manipulate your equipment, know your equipment. And these are the channel devices. 
the AirTrack, the Kingvision, the Glidescope, the CMAC all pr provide devices with a channel for the tube. And most anesthesiologists really don't like these because it really it ties you down. But maybe there is a place for this in confined airway space management, and I'll come back to that later. Also, there might be use for the more special devices. This is the Viva site with the camera on, on in the chip. And this is the light wand, very old device, but it might also be of use in confined airway. Again, an anti-recommendation is using the digital intubation. Very few studies, it's described as a forgotten art, but the only studies where they actually looked at this, very experienced uh, uh, providers considered this to be both unsafe and uncomfortable. So we should shy away from doing digital intubation if we can. Okay, so you've all seen a picture like this. Yes, inverse intubation, ice pick intubation seems, seems a good name for somat. Uh, the tomahawk or the face-to-face. -face. It, it really is, uh, that's the same, it's the same technique where you build standing in front of the patient and you'll intubate them uh, in this uh, up the up, uh, upside down position. And there are several studies looking at this inverse technique both in simulated and, and uh, uh, retrospective cases. And you can do it either with this one being a direct laryngoscope, uh, laryngoscope or you can use a VL. It's still difficult. Uh, and what is difficult that you actually, you turn everything around. What's left is right, what's, r what's up is now down. And you really don't have the normal axis and direct view of the uh, of the vocal cords which you would have in a normal intubation so this is something really uh, really difficult and just putting the laryngoscope in your right hand challenges your hand eye coordination so this is where the channel devices might be a good idea so it sort of frees you up you can insert it with your right hand and it's more it's the uh, it's the laryngoscope that actually delivers the tube and you can push the tube in by yourself or you can have an assistant putting in the tube for you. But this, is, might, be, this might be a good idea. So positioning of you as a rescuer. So much work have been done by our colleagues in France and uh, I stole these very nice illustrations from one of the publications. Um, and these, there are several different options of how you can position yourself. There is the lateral left and right position, there's the kneeling position, there's the sitting position, and there's the prone position, and there's the straddle position. <laughs> but it all comes down to uh, ergonomics. Whether you are able to straighten out this axis, get a good view of the courts. So um, whether you choose, which one ever you choose, you have to train again, train, train, train. And you will expect it, you will expect a worse laryngoscope, laryngoscope view and less ease of intubation. But if, um, if you do have, uh, I'll just one back here, but there are differences. The left lateral position is associated with better glottic exposure compared to the kneeling position. And you can apply greater force using the straddle position. And it sort of makes sense that if you're sitting behind the patient or kneeling behind the patient, you, will have, you will won't have that really, really good alignment of the airway axis as you would do uh, being prone or uh, in the lateral position. Again, put in the superglottic, extricate the patient. So the patient is now stuck in a very awkward position. This has 
not being, stud uh, not being studied a lot. But there are several case stories about uh, patients being intubated in different positions. This one is an, it's a case from Colombia where this gentleman uh, had a disagreement with another gentleman and he placed a large knife in his, uh, in his uh, neck. So he couldn't be uh, on his back and the anesthesiologist tubed him uh, while prone and he actually described that it was very easy because when the patient was anesthetized, everything tended to fall down and uh, down and uh, downwards, and it was actually very very easy to intubate him in this position. I haven't tried this. Um, obviously, using a video device will make it easier, and I think in some ORs this is used as a standard uh, uh, and not having the patient put in prone position after anesthesia induced. And this is a lateral position. But again, the very few publications all describe ver worse laryngoscopy U and less ease of intubation. And last but not least, but not supported by any evidence, I think doing a front of neck axis as your first attempt is actually a very good solution uh, in many cases. So this is a very nice picture I've borrowed from one of our colleagues in, in Denmark. Actually, the gentleman you uh, saw in the picture with the very busted uh, truck earlier. Okay. So again, to summarize, don't intubate patients in confined airway spaces stick in a superglottic and extricate them. We'll talk about this a lot more tonight. Thank you, Søren. Uh -huh. Yeah, we're all going to try later on. Special circumstances back to this gentleman, bleeding and difficult airway at the same time. This same situation, bending forward, gravity pulls blood out of him. The surgeon trying to compress the bleeding. The anesthesiologist is looking a bit um, uh, thoughtful about what to do. Uh, this is the anesthesiologist. So we had to start a literature, come up with recommendations on actually how to manage this bloody bleeding airway. It's also in the book. What is special here is that several of our favorite techniques that solve 98% of situations, they can be rendered useless due to the blood. So we are stuck with some basic uh, or alternative choices. So of course, compress the bleeding side, position the patient, often he needs to sit upright or even leaning forward. Be sure to suction all that you can, keep oxygen all that you can. And remember fluid uh, resuscitation because if you give anesthesia, he may have bled a lot. And then evaluate the airway and that includes identifying the cryocothyroid membrane. And it's enough with the 15 seconds evaluation and the cryocothyroid membrane. If we predict successful direct laryngoscopy and we can identify the cryocothyroid membrane, then it's um, okay to go on with a rapid sequence induction. So this could be called the anatomically easy bleeding airway. And we get some help from Chris. Yeah, you are right from New Mexico. Thank you for giving us the advice. And this is this way we move forward with green. Terrific. Okay, uh, I'm going to take a page from Rasmus. Everyone, close your eyes. Imagine you are in a picturesque mountain town at 1,500 meters elevation. There is a 3,000 meter peak just above. The air is cool and crisp. The food is delicious. You're in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, that is where I live and work. Uh, I, it's near Texas. I'm not from Texas, you can tell, because I'm unarmed. Um, so prior to moving to Albuquerque, New Mexico, I was a New York City paramedic for about 10 years. I attempted to intubate many people. Every now and then I did it successfully. I became very interested in how to manage the contaminated airway, the airway that's been soiled, because so many of the airways we encounter are full of stuff that we wish wasn't there, right? So raise your hand if you've ever had to manage a contaminated airway before. 
I presumed as much. Raise your hand if before the first time you had to manage a contaminated airway, you had received or you had practiced deliberately how to manage that airway in simulation. A lot less hands, but it's exciting that there are a number of hands up. So I met and got to teach with a gentleman named Jim DeCanto. He's a mad scientist who moonlights as an anesthesiologist. He developed a technique after tinkering with mannequins in his garage called the salad technique, suction-assisted laryngoscopy and airway decontamination. Uh, are there? There might not be. OK. Okay, we'll we'll flick through the slides. Should I should I just we'll first take the situation. Okay, first we'll check the situation where, where it's difficult, meaning that um, we predict uh, we have difficulty with front and neck airway access. Um, and um, why is that the case? Uh, it, it's because necks look like this and not like your necks. And um, this is uh, one of the situations. This is uh, Dauma who's going to have anesthesia. I look at her the day before. and. Uh, I have no idea why, where might her cricocyte membrane be. And if I needed uh, to do an emergency airway access, should it be here or where should it be? Fortunately, we can use ultrasound to identify uh, uh, the cricocyte membrane. And uh, you see the structures here, and we have a stepwise approach that um, you'll all um, uh, learn tonight. And we call it um, uh, pearls on a string. The first one, you put the probe uh, like this, and you identify the trachea in the midline. And then next step is that you slide the probe uh, laterally so that you kind of truncate trachea in half. You rotate into the longitudinal position like this, and there you see black pearls on a white string. And um, that's the anterior part of the trachea rings. And then you move cranially. You see the cricoid cartilage. You move further cranially. And there you see the thyroid cartilage, and um, then uh, um, you can uh, mark the longitudinal course of the airway uh, like this. And then I need to ask, um, will you? Okay, so as uh, we always have to uh, to improvise, as you know. Um, okay, so we found the longitudinal course of the trachea, and then we can find um, the place of the cricocyte membrane by sliding this needle under the transducer and looking for the shadow cast uh, by the ultrasound beam, and that's here. And then we make a cross, and this is the midpoint of the cricocyte membrane. It looks like this in a difficult patient with a short neck, previous radiation therapy, 1.8 centimeter mouth opening, and a limited neck extension, typical landmark palpation. And we do like this. We place the probe transversely. You see um, a trachea ring. You go longitudinally, and we see um, this is the cricoid cartilage, and, um, and we see the trachea ring. We mark the longitudinal course. We slide the needle underneath, and you can see the shadow from the needle coming there, and you uh, mark again with a pen. And if you, um, in this case, we just confirm with the transverse technique, and you can learn both today. This is the, uh, here you see the cricoid cartilage. You move up again, and you've seen the cricothyroid uh, membrane there. And it's the same place. It's identified. He's awake. He's got uh, nasal oxygen. And we want to give some local anesthesia before waking to basin. So we use our new information, where is the cricocyte membrane. We do a needle cricocyrotomy. 
uh, like we also did in the previous video, we aspirate, and this is verification that we're actually uh, in the right place, and we can give uh, local anesthesia. And uh, this is that on the day of surgery, uh, we identify the quagliocyte member, and you see it's very lateral on her neck, and you see it's confirmed by CT scan, but this is more useful information than a CT scan because it actually shows where is it on this uh, specific uh, patient in this specific moment. And we just uh, made this study where we had a, a, a thick neck constructed where you couldn't palpate anything. And um, then we could place, we could have the, the airway deviated to one of the sides. Please open the MacBook. <laughs> and uh, and uh, then we could ask uh, um, colleagues, consultants, uh, in a randomized fashion to either palpate or, um, or uh, use ultrasound. And with palpation, only 3.5% identify the quagliocyte membrane, whereas uh, with ultrasound, with a, after a very brief course, three thirds actually were able to identify. So um, this leads us to the awake um, uh, access when, um, when you have a predicted difficult airway and we can do a wake tracheostomy and we can do one of all these techniques. Transillumination, you already saw it, Sean showed it from the inside, we showed it with the infrared. Um, intubation by a superglottic airway device that you will learn about today. And then uh, cricothyrotomy uh, tracheostomy and retrograde intubation. And you already saw it presented, but this is how it looks in the bloody bleeding airway. This is a surgeon. She's Five tens. The patient is difficult. He's obese. He was difficult before, and he came in the emergency room bleeding. He needs surgery. He will be very difficult to do a tracheostomy on. He's sitting, gets nasal oxygen. He know it's dangerous. He's very cooperative. There's nothing that motivates you like uh, being in this situation. And um, uh, just a minute. This should. Um, become a video showing how we identify the cricothyroid membrane with ultrasound and um, just a minute, we go forward and one more, this one and um, we do the retrograde uh, intubation there it is, you see, it's a mess but it's highly motivated you see the cricothyroid membrane and the, the surgeon never saw this before, but she's very grateful that we can help him. We put in some local anesthesia because we know that you might need an emergency quagliothyrotomy. And then we, uh, we have identified the quagliothyrotomy membrane. We also saw so that. We do this. We do the needle quagliothyrotomy as I showed you in elective setting. Now it is in emergency setting. We aspirate, confirm that we're actually in the airway. And then we take the epidural catheter, you'll all practice this technique this evening. You put it in, you take the natural curvature of the epidural catheter so that it goes cranially. The, the surgeon never saw an epidural catheter. I said, look for a plastic thing coming up, help me, help me pulling it out. She says, yes, she's very highly motivated, otherwise she has to go to, uh, attack this neck. So she does as we say. She, oh, there it is. She pulls it out, the epidural catheter. And he helps by spitting it out a bit. And again, highly motivated. There it comes. And now all we have to do is to make this uh, uh, half knot through the Murphy eye. And then we'll see which technique we use this time. We have, we have of course, worked on the tick. Then you uh, uh, put the epidural catheter via the, uh, up via the tube. And then once, once it's in place, we will switch to pulling the tube down because then we don't need to see anything. We just go beyond all the blood and uh, damaged uh, tissue uh, that we got there. And now, by pulling the distal end, I ask the patient, please stick out your tongue. And the surgeon keeps compressing the bleeding side. And um, yes, uh, we pull down the um, the tube until uh, we encounter resistance and when we encounter resistance 
we stop pulling because then we're on the inside of the quarkus membrane, then we start pushing instead. And uh, there's no coughing because he already had a lot of blood, so he has uh, had all the, c the coughing that he uh, did beforehand. And then you connect the, the um, ventilatory equipment, you see uh, waveform capnography, and you can put the patient to sleep. So that's one of the methods that we can use in this uh, bloody bleeding situation, and you'll all try it uh, at the workshop later. Okay, and it's very cheap. Then uh, another um, special uh, circumstance is if we have to manage the airway with, may I have your attention please? You'll all try it in the workshop, you <laughs> don't have to discuss the technique now. Uh, if we have uh, little, or, or, or one little or no device in the airway because it's so narrow, and why would we need that? It uh, could be because this is uh, Karen McGrady, she looks fairly normal, but uh, this is uh, how her airway looks. She has a very tight narrowing, uh, superglottically, there's not even space for a tube size four zero, so she needs this. Uh, this is uh, uh, Henne. She looks very normal, very normal airway. But look what happens w if when we look into her mouth and beyond that, she has uh, different uh, pathologies, including chondrosarcoma. She needs various surgery. There's no space for tube, uh, but not even for uh, for probably not even for jet ventilation here. And uh, this is Frank, and he has only a small pathology there in his airway, but he has a very severe pulmonary hypertension, so it's actually high risk putting him to sleep at all. So all this needs some alternative from a standard treatment. And uh, it may be because we have limited space for airway management, limited space for surgery, or because you want to avoid general anesthesia. So how can we do this? We have several techniques. And all of these techniques have some pros and cons and advantages. And we'll look at a few of these. And um, a question is always, is this technique good enough for the patient uh, allowing suspension laryngoscopy? But because that will be necessary for much of the surgery here. And uh, if you take a fully awake patient with local anesthesia, that could be Eric that we saw before, give him local anesthesia, do awake surgery with uh, the flexible scope, so we can take a biopsy from this tumor, that's fine, but only, almost only with the flexible scope, otherwise um, uh, the patient will not tolerate it. So with the awake patient, we cannot really do suspension laryngoscopy. How much can we see? This is a percent of glottic opening, and 100% if we can see the, uh, the whole thing. And with this, of course, we can see the whole thing. Uh, will this does not allow balloon dilatation for stenosis. It allows us to vary, vary, vary the oxygen fraction if we want to use a laser. Uh, so we can use the HFNVO, high, f uh, high flow nasal variable oxygen fraction. There will be CO2 elimination because the patient is breathing. We, it allows dynamic airway observation. So if we have, uh, we, if we have um, 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 the vocal cord pathology or if we have a a soft trachea, for instance, we can evaluate that, but it demands an open airway and there's no cough, there's no protection against the aspiration. Then, if you put the patient to sleep but he's still breathing spontaneously, then we can do suspension laryngoscopy and the rest is almost the same. Then, if we move a bit high um, uh, to a bit um, a different technique where we give the high flow, and you'll all try that in the workshop, you know, we can go up to 70 liters per minute and that does allow, you know, the high flow. Many of you use it at home and it feels nice as long as you don't turn too much up. This will allow brief precision, uh, procedures with suspension laryngoscopy, but only very brief. And um, it will allow uh, a full glottic opening to be seen. It will allow balloon dilatation if we make a break, but we need 100% oxygen here. We cannot go lower for. Uh, for laser surgery, it has been tried, but that in the, uh, that will um, um, result in a lower uh, successful oxygenation and uh, often a need for intubation. And uh, if we have the high uh, oxygen fraction, we will sometimes get an airway fire. So we have a dilemma there. So we cannot really go down in um, in the oxygen fraction. And then when it comes to 
CO2 elimination? That's a crucial question. You know, in the, in the beginning, some years ago, we called this thrive, the high flow nasal oxygen, because we thought there was a ventilation. But we doubted that. We took 35 patients. We gave them full anesthesia and new muscular blockade. We gave them 70 liters of oxygen per minute, and then we just waited. Took an arterial gas and transcutaneous CO2 every five minutes, or continuously, wait until the pH uh, CO2 rose to 12 kilopascal, or the pH fell to 7.15. And this is what resulted. The apnea duration is on the x-axis. After a median of 25 minutes, uh, uh, the patient reached uh, this uh, severe acidosis, and the range was unpredictable between 20 and 45 minutes. So we could conclude that unpredictable respiratory acidosis will develop if we just give high flow nasal and, and do surgery. And our colleagues uh, here from, uh, from Bern, they did a very nice study where they used different levels of flows. And the result is that the CO2 increase is the same. So there is no ventilatory effect of the high flows as opposed to what was thought a few years ago. So it's not useful for, really useful for laser and it doesn't give us any CO2 uh, elimination, which is important, of course. And there's just now, a few months ago, published some cases with high flow nasal oxygen, saturation 100%, but cardiac arrest due to severe hypercarbia. And another case, unconsciousness uh, due to um, uh, high CO2. So it's not to um, taken, uh, be taken lightly, and it will not allow a cough inflation. Then we had the jet ventilation, either supra infraglottically, you know these two techniques, they will give either 100% U or 75% U of the vocal cords. Um, they will allow balloon dilatation if you have a superglottic. They will allow a mixture of oxygen uh, so that we can go low in, oxy low in oxygen fraction for laser surgery. They will um, allow uh, CO2 elimination so we get some ventilation. And the rest of the answer is this, and we still have uh, aspiration risk. Then what about the common uh, technique? apnea with repeated intubation. That is definitely possible. It, the question is to use a, a tube that as thin as possible. And there you see in the middle, we've got a tube size 4-0. And that doesn't always allow ventilation, but it often does. The other one is the tri-tube, only 2.4 millimeters internal diameter. We'll get back to that. So um, this will allow us 100% when the tube is out and down to 45% when it's in. Uh, it will allow balloon dilatation. We could go down in the oxygen fraction. We will have CO2 elimination, but we will not have a cough in for the whole procedure. Then we can go so low in, um, in tube diameter that we can do some of the surgery at least. And there we got this beautiful tritope that you'll all have the possibility to try today. Only 2.4 millimeter internal diameter. And that's, of course, only necessary because of special techniques. So you had three lumina, interluminal. Uh, for the ventilation, then for the pressure measurement, distal uh, in the in the airway, and then for the balloon, and this is all we need: uh, 15 liters of fresh gas, and then we can use the vent train manually. So we have uh, active inspiration and active expiration. So we suction the gas out of the lungs and inflate it again. Also called flow control ventilation, very gentle to the lungs, and this is uh, during surgery. And nowadays we can even get a ventilator. You will get to see and play with that during uh, the workshop. And this is how it looks, suspension laryngoscopy with a small tube in it. And uh, after surgery, you can see the uh, tube is so small, you can get away with a lot of surgery there. So if we use um, the tri-tube, we'll, we'll like to see a three-fourth of the glottic opening. And um, th this will not allow balloon dilatation. We can go down in oxygen fraction for laser surgery. Um, and this will allow an inflated cough for the whole procedure. As the only of the techniques, we can have an inflated cough if we have a severe risk of regurgitation or for getting debris in the airway. And then, um, what about front of neck airway access for this? That could either be a, a jet ventilation through the cricocele membrane or an elective tracheostomy, which is often used here. And uh, it gives us a good view of the glottic opening. Um, we can vary, uh, um, variate the oxygen fraction, and but we only got uh, protection against aspiration if we do a wake tracheostomy and inflate the cough. Otherwise, we don't. Then we have 
something that we heard this morning that ECMO is discutable when it comes to, for instance, cardiac arrest, but when it comes to airway, it's excellent, even in a semi-emergent situation. We just had one that was a brilliant example of this. So Vino, uh, Venus bifemoral uh, ECMO is the way to go. It doesn't even uh, need anticoagulant therapy. It allows 100% uh, glottic opening. We can go down the oxygen fraction. And this is the only technique that doesn't demand an open airway. So it's useful for obstructing tumors in the lower trachea or around the bifurcation of the airway. Uh, but it will not uh, prevent aspiration necessarily. Okay, so we got a lot of choices. But you may still ask, is that really all? No. We would like a technique that works for awake and anesthetized patients without any device in the airway that allows an FiO2 as we want it and that works in a physiological better hemodynamic profile, meaning that we get less uh, uh, blood pressure fall when we uh, give anesthesia and can work for a prolonged period of time. And you're all going to try that at the workshop. It is a cuirass ventilation, extrathoracic cuirass ventilation. And uh, I bring this, uh, this is a cuirass. Um, um, you know it from the uh, Roman Empire, made of, uh, uh, made of uh, cow skin at that time, but made in uh, metal uh, as well, and now made in plexiglass. And uh, this was the first time I tried it on. I remember it still because that was the first time in my adult life that I didn't even have to breathe. So it's so relaxing. I was almost falling asleep. I said, wow, we need to develop that for airway surgery. And this is how it looks. So you can apply negative pressure. Then you rise the thoracic cage. And you also get diaphragmatic movement. And with the positive pressure, it goes the other way. So it allows ventilation from the outside. And this is how it looks. This is our pre-resident, he is in our department, he wants to be a resident, so we can use him for anything. So, yes. he uh, he's willing to uh, to let us yes. demonstrate. We'll so, the straps here. we put the cuirass on. This. Yes, and um, the, now we attach um, the ventilator that will cuirass. create positive oh. negative pressure, pressure in the shell. A blue the the tubing, tubing is for measuring the pressure in there. Two. And then, uh, uh, we put on the French spontaneous CO2 measurement because that's a brilliant way to measure if ventilation actually is sufficient. Okay, so now and then, the in this case, a nasal mask, mask because you can use that you are not together with the gas supply from the anesthesia machine. Just need to maintain and then, if we maintain jaw thrust, we have, a we have an open airway, we can do no whatever we want with that airway. But we have to maintain the airway open, of course. Then, even nicer, so which we use almost all the time nowadays, is to combine. So we put on the high flow nasal oxygen, but with an air mixer so that we can go down in oxygen percentage for laser surgery. And we can do that because we have the ventilation, which we don't have with the high flow nasal in itself. So with this, it solves many of the uh, challenges that I uh, mentioned before. And due to the transcutaneous CO2, we, uh, we can be sure that we are not, we don't reach the dangerous level that I uh, showed you beforehand. So back to Henne, the patient here, looks normal, it doesn't look normal here. So mask ventilation, transcutaneous CO2, arterial line, we used that in the beginning, place the grass, um, uh, start mounting the surgical equipment, suspension, laryngoscope, and uh, in this time we use the nasal mask, we use the high flow nasal uh, most of the time, and then uh, start the surgery, and this is what we see. So you have the patient ventilated, with only surgical equipment, no airway equipment in the airway. And um, you see how it goes. And there you see a totally unobstructed field for surgery that allows using multiple instruments during the same case without switching, without intermediate uh, intubation. And um, so here we got 100% if you have the glottic opening. We can uh, vary uh, the uh, oxygen fraction. We just uh, a few months ago published the first care series on this, even with a cookbook. So you actually go to the DJA or you can go to the reference list and follow this cookbook. And if you uh, uh, take care of a uh, few things, it will work. You combine with the high flow nasal. These are our results. We used it for, among other, laser surgery. Um, this is the CO2 monitoring in the beginning.
uh, paste an air uh, arterial line, but then we made this study in the meantime where we uh, compared arterial gas with transcutaneous, and it's a very nice uh, correlation. So now most of the time we only use the transcutaneous to monitor this. And actually in this case here, uh, we only found the difference of 0.6 uh, kilopascal maximum. Um, we had uh, even at the end of uh, ventilation maximum 7.3 kilopascal, meaning definitely in the safe range. And that works, but we'll keep refining and show you a new way of uh, measuring um, the ventilation from the outside for the expiring. And you can also try that at the workshop. We put on some electrodes that will measure the impedance over the right lung. That means that when we put some, uh, we create some kind of ventilation um, um, with the grass because we cannot measure um, um, entire CO2. We have this device. And the curve will come up um, here. You see, every breath uh, it gives an impedance change, so we know breath by breath whether actually a ventilation is going on, which is very nice because we don't want no airway obstruction. So we have we can uh, we have ventilation. We can change the FiO2. Uh, it will still demand an open airway. And in this series, we had up to about an hour. We have had longer cases now. And what about the surgical conditions? In all cases, the surgeon spontaneously reported we never had so good conditions. So, yeah, shortcomings, yeah, no real experience in morbidly obese, but John, who is also here, who will demonstrate it, has uh, from intensive care some good cases with obese patients, actually, which we haven't had for surgery. And then a uh, very important, if you have floppy tissue, for instance, you have a papilloma or something, you have to be careful to keep the airway open, meaning Place a suspension laryngoscope open so that uh, early in the case so that the air will, will stay open. And um, yeah, so we can tailor this to our patients. All of these things we can tailor to our patients. And uh, that's actually one of our main messages. And now um, we, we will have a small um, uh, change in the program because now uh, Michael will present the, the workshop setup while I find Chris's presentation. So, and that's a surprise to Michael, but we are used to working like this. So, uh, you just go through the stations here. That's all, and, and so that you can uh, make people look forward to uh, this. I most certainly will. Look at this. In the uh, workshop, we have um, six um, or seven uh, stations, depending on how you look at it. One with the uh, ultrasound identification of the cricothyroid membrane. One with uh, front of neck access. Uh, one with uh, caress ventilation and uh, thrive uh, or at least uh, high flow nasal oxygen um, bloody bleeding airway two of them one with uh, what we call the the easy part and one with the uh, difficult uh, part what is special here is that in all the stations you will have the opportunity to try things uh, yourselves. There will be uh, a lot of blood, a lot of uh, difficulties, but it will uh, go very well in the end. We have a, a confined airway, confined space um, airway management uh, station, an uh, indoor uh, section and an outdoor section. Uh, it's meant to be uh, that the indoor section you uh, try diff uh, different uh, tools and then you go uh, outside uh, for a more realistic scenario to experience that it is probably a little bit more difficult intubating patients in this scenari scenario than uh, you are used to back home. So, a good idea 
A good idea will be to uh, bring a jacket to the workshop because uh, you wouldn't want to miss the uh, outdoor session conducted by uh, Yelchen. Very good idea, Søren. Søren uh, reminds that uh, you should not only bring your jacket, you should also bring, if you want to, a large beer. Okay, so as I was saying, the salad technique, suction-assisted laryngoscopy and airway decontamination, a proactive stepwise approach to manage the contaminated airway. I was taught that suction is something that's important to have around, right? But I wasn't taught to use it actively. So this is a video uh, from Mexico, or as we call it in Albuquerque, old Mexico. Um, and hopefully, this will show some examples of an airway we are probably all familiar with, which is a contaminated airway. Could you just click to see if the video will play? Yeah. So uh, this is a cardiac arrest. We often encounter soiled airways in cardiac arrest. Uh, sometimes, or some studies have shown that upwards of 40%, to me it seems like 100% of the cardiac arrest airways I arrive at are soiled. So here a junior resident is attempting to intubate uh, the patient. The airway is obviously uh, significantly contaminated by blood associated with the chest compressions. Uh, and the airway is presenting a lot of difficulty. There are a lot of cuts because there are pauses as they kind of recalibrate the approach. So we're using video laryngoscopy here and we are about to encounter one of the primary pitfalls associated with video laryngoscopy which is as soon as the lens becomes contaminated, right, uh, especially if we're not using a standard geometry device, we have to abort the attempt, reconsider what it is that we're doing. So with the salad technique, we're gonna practice proactively using suction to help us manage the airway, both as a means of mitigating the contaminant and as a tool for airway management. So now, someone who has experience with the salad technique and has practiced on a vomiting mannequin at some point is going to attempt the intubation. And you'll see that when they introduce the laryngoscope, they're staying high away from the contaminant, and they're gonna put the catheter, which we can see here, out in front of the laryngoscope to actively manage all of the contaminant that's coming up as the airway attempt is ongoing. And now, what's happened is that the catheter has been withdrawn from the mouth and reinserted opposite the laryngoscope. So we're gonna leave the catheter in place throughout the intubation attempt. The catheter is gonna sit in the hypopharynx to continuously suction out whatever gastric contaminant is coming up, whatever blood is coming up, and that'll allow us to maintain a clear visualization throughout the attempt. So, what does airway contamination do? It negates ventilation by mask ventilation or supraglottic airway, right? It neutralizes our attempts at apneic oxygenation, and it essentially negates all forms of endoscopy. So salad manages airway contaminants while assisting the rescuer in placing basic and advanced airways. We are proactively addressing the contaminated airway. We're also creating space to utilize our airway management devices. This is not just about intubation, right? Uh, when we've seen supraglottic airways fail, right, that's often because we have not adequately created space to introduce the device to seat it in the hypopharynx. So uh, I was taught that you can just stick your thumb into the mandible and pull it forwards, but you can also use a suction catheter in order to create that space to introduce the device. So specific steps of the salad technique. And what I'd like everyone to do is just mentally rehearse this so that when we get to the station, you can actually practice this hands-on. It'll be like, it won't be the first time you've done it. It'll be kind of the second time you've done it. So you're about to intubate. You have your laryngoscope off to the left. You're holding a suction catheter in your right hand, ideally a larger bore suction catheter because uh, Yankauer catheter was invented by Dr. Yankauer to dab blood out of the surgical field during a tonsillectomy. That is not what we are using suction catheters for in emergency situations, right? So we're gonna hold the catheter overhand and insert it into the airway 
to suck to start to suction out any contaminant that's in there and to proactively distract the mandible in order to create space to introduce our supraglottic device or our laryngoscope. Once we have the catheter around the base of the tongue, distracting the mandible forwards while providing suction, we'll now insert our supraglottic device or our laryngoscope. Then we will manipulate the tissues of the tongue uh, and the hypopharynx to maximize our view as we get the laryngoscope into position. So instead of having to kind of scoop and incrementally move around the base of the tongue with the laryngoscope, we can really use the catheter to create, to maximize that space in the molecula, in the hypopharyngeal space, in order to really seat that laryngoscope exactly where we want it. Finally, we will withdraw the suction catheter from the right side of the mouth and reinsert it to the left of the laryngoscope, parking it in the hypopharynx. And now the catheter will stay out of our primary visual field, but it will sit in the hypopharynx throughout the intubation attempt. So even if the patient continues to regurgitate, even if the patient continues to bleed, whatever contaminant is pooling in the hypopharynx will continuously be suctioned throughout the attempt. So here is one more video of a gunshot wound to the face where the salad technique is employed as the initial airway approach. Oh. I have to go back. Let's mouse is getting there. Warmer. Warm warmer. Red hot. Okay. So a lot of blood pulling in the hypopharynx. The catheter is way out in front of the laryngoscope and it's being used to distract the mandible and create that space. The, in this attempt, they did actually leave the catheter in place on the right side of the mouth, but it is in the hypopharynx continuing to suction any blood that is pooling. The bougie is introduced easily. The tube is slid over the bougie. And in seconds, what could be a nightmare airway scenario is mitigated by proactively and deliberately using your suction instead of reaching for it once you've realized you have a problem. So uh, I will give the microphone back to Michael. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Time for a beer and then workshop and discussion and questions and feedback and good ideas to work on. Thank you very much. <laughs>